Quick content warning. This video contains images of violence involving knives as an abstract metaphor that is also a literal example of a character opposing patriarchal norms. But still, there are images of knife violence. So the title of my presentation today is X Women to Watch Out For, Bechdel Testing X-Men Comics Within a Mixed Methods Research Design. Now talking about Bechdel testing at a academic conference in 2021 is kind of like showing up at an IT conference in that same year and talking about Web 2.0. Um, I'm outdated here, but I have a point. So my thesis is this. Applying the Bechdel test to Chris Claremont's 16-year run on Uncanny X-Men reveals a major inconsistency with established gender roles presented in Marvel Comics both before and after Claremont, and that when we integrate Bechdel testing into a broader study, we can find that it has a great deal of value despite popular concerns regarding the application of Bechdel testing. So for some context here. The Bechdel test has been used extensively as a metric for determining whether or not a media work meets a very low bar for representation of female characters. The test itself is named for Alison Bechdel, a comics writer and artist who first coined the term as part of her underground comic strip Dykes to Watch Out For in 1985. Bechdel herself would go on to play a significant role in the comics literature movement with the publication of her 2006 book Fun Home. The Bechdel test is not the most precise measure of gender representation. Robbie Collin famously noted, uh, that the Bechdel test is damaging to the way we think about film in an article from The Telegraph in 2013. Uh, his complaint was that the test has a tendency to simplify the complexity of representational concerns because it prizes box ticking and stat hoarding over analysis and appreciation. For my part, I agree with Collins' assessment in principle. What I think he fails to consider is the value of a mixed methods research methodology and the extent to which those ticks boxes can create or facilitate stronger discussions when paired with qualitative analysis. So passing the Bechdel test does not indicate quality gender representation, as many of the opponents of the test have suggested it is meant to. Rather, the Bechdel test reveals a broad and pervasive pattern when applied to a large enough sample. So to pass the Bechdel test, all your comic book or movie or whatever needs to do is to have a scene in which two or more female characters talk to each other about something other than a man. That's it. That is the Bechdel test. It represents a minimum low bar that our media can fail to surpass. Not every movie or comic book should pass the Bechdel test, but a lot of them should. And when that isn't happening, this generalizing tool can be a useful indicator of a general problem. So long as the sample, as I said, is large uh, and Claremont's run on Uncanny X-Men is the largest sample of a single author run in Marvel Comics history. Again, 16 years. Um, so it's well suited to the cause. Now, um, to give you some sense of, of what we've been able to identify here, um, during the Claremont run, Uncanny X-Men passes the Bechdel test 82% of the time. Uh, for contrast, the only major sales competition that Claremont had once Uncanny X-Men took off was from Frank Miller's work on Daredevil during two legendary arcs of that series that centered around female characters, Elektra and Karen Page, respectively. Now, in spite of having these prominent female characters, not one of Miller's issues from either of those runs passes the Bechdel test. Similarly disappointing is the work of other Claremont contemporaries. Steve Englehart's famous run on Avengers from 1972 to 1976 passes in 13 out of 45 issues, so 28%. Doug Bench's run on Master of Kung Fu from 74 to 83 comes in at 11 out of 88 issues, so 12.5%. Uh, and Mench's Moon Knight run from 80 to 82 comes in out of 1 out of 15 issues. Uh, in fact, the only competition Claremont really had in terms of his Bechdel test passing was from John Byrne's She-Hulk at 73%, a very good number. But remember that John Byrne's She-Hulk is the story of a lead female character with a female sidekick, and it can still only pass the Bechdel test 73% of the time, which is, I would argue, you know, sad. <laughs> Uh, so, what else can we do with this data? I mean, obviously, we're identifying something here. Claremont is passing 82% of the time. His contemporaries are not. Uh, and as a result of that, we have this sort of discrepancy. Well, one thing you can do with the data is cross-reference it. Um, so, when cross-referencing Claremont's success in the Bechdel test with editors, another notable trend is revealed. Under his first two editors, Roger Stern and Jim Salakrup, Claremont passes about half the time. 52% Stern, 50% Salakrup. Then Louise Simonson comes on board as editor, beginning in issue number 137. Claremont then passes 80% of the time. 
when Anne Nascenti takes over as the editor, that number goes up to 94% of the time, uh, before dipping back down to 87% once Bob Harris becomes the editor. There are other variables at play here, most notably Claremont's general improvement in representing female characters and even just like the changing of the times. But this data nonetheless suggests the importance of having women in editorial positions due to their potential to positively affect the representation of women in those comics. So we sort of found something we weren't really looking for through cross-referencing. Now, to give you like a, a much broader spectrum approach, um, we did a representative sample. So we tried to figure out how to create like an average for Marvel Comics and then compare that to Claremont's output, which we had already Bechdel tested. Um, so what we did was um, we did a representative sample uh, involving over a thousand comic books from Marvel um, during the Claremont run era. Uh, so what we would do was we would go to Marvel Unlimited. We would choose two months out of every year um, at random uh, and Bechdel test every comic listed as published in that month of that year. Uh, in order to give us a year-by-year -year rough estimate um, of their passing. Um, now, the main thing to note here is that Claremont was included in this sample, uh, by which I mean we often included Claremont comics in our sample of Marvel line-wide. Um, so a lot of the passes, if you will, that they're getting are from Claremont, uh, <laughs> pushing those numbers up, um, even you know as we're using it as a comparator. But anyway... Um, the discrepancy is huge. Uh, you can see on the chart here that the, the lines are nicely parallel uh, in their trajectories and movements. Um, other than 78, there's some anomalies there um, in terms of the publishing output. So eh, that kind of messed it up a little bit. Uh, but generally speaking, you can see that the lines move in accordance with each other, which usually suggests a good representative sample. Uh, now, what you'll also note is just how far apart they are. Uh, on average, Uncanny X-Men under Chris Claremont is passing the Bechdel test 42% more each year than Marvel line-wide, including Claremont. Uh, I'm hoping that makes sense. I know that I made it more confusing than I wanted it to be, but I, I really wanted to kind of um, skew the numbers against us to show how you know big a find this is. Um, so you have someone who's passing Bechdel just way, way, way more uh, than his publisher's average during this time period. So um, what do we do with this? Uh, the Bechdel test on its own doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove positive representation. It proves the absence of positive representation, again, as a general trend, but woven into a broader pattern and it becomes something more effective. Um, now, our methodology for this project is based on John Creswell's research design, which is in like its sixth edition at this point, um, which is a mixed methods approach, meaning we combine qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, so, I don't know, this one's controversial and interdisciplinary and all the ways that like interdisciplinary is a buzzword kind of apply and create all the problems that it usually does. Um, but it is truly interdisciplinary in the sense that we are actually using quantitative data in order to um, spur our qualitative analysis. Now, the big distinction here, though, is that traditionally quantitative data is used as evidence. It's proving. In a mixed methods design, you can use quantitative data as prompting which is to say it's a thing that spurs the analysis rather than a thing that um, substantiates a claim. Um, so we, again, use it. We, we, we see this big number and we think, okay, what does this suggest? What do we need to look at in order to figure out why this number is so big? Uh, so we incorporate additional coding. We start looking at things like how many characters have thought bubbles and text bubbles in each issue, um, you know, contrast them by gender, contrast them by sexuality, um, anything we can think of, any form of cross-referencing. We do additional coding on character behavior. So I can tell you how many times Wolverine surrenders. I can tell you how many times Storm hugs somebody. Uh, I can tell you who carries who in a flight sequence um, in like each issue of Claremont's run. Uh, again, like, like we really tried to get into the, the finer details in order to, again, give us something to come back to. Um, these, these little details that tend to be gender coded um, to see how they play off of the, the gender data that we were generating. Um, we can also look at fan studies data in, in terms of like reception analysis, thinking about how Claremont has been received, um, how his stories and his characters are shipped. So we did extensive testing of, um, ooh, I think it was 4,000 works of fan art. <laughs> On the subject of Chris Claremont's X-Men. Um, not extensive analysis, because I'm not going to make anyone read that much fan fiction, but um, we did study it. Uh, and then um, our full data sets are available at Claremont Run. You can see everything that we did. I know I'm running low on time, um, but you can get our spreadsheets and all that. Um, so what we get is like pieces of a puzzle. Gail Simone says that Claremont is responsible for a sea change in the representation of comics. Um, Claremont, in 1982 interview, says he's taking this on. 
uh, he wants to represent women well. Uh, on two separate instances in Marvel Comics history, you have um, in jokes about Claremont appearing in Marvel canon uh, about Claremont's belief that you have to re represent women uh, more powerfully. Uh, again, this question of is there any reason a character can't be a woman as a starting point. Um, so all of this is to say that um, Bechdel testing Claremont comics can reveal some kind of cool new things when integrated into a broader research study, again, using a mixed methods approach. Uh, there's a really big number here uh, and, and there's a lot of discussion about his impact. So putting those things together and putting them into a broader tapestry uh, of, again, qualitative analysis uh, that we normally do very well in comic studies um, allows us to draw broader conclusions and uh, allows us to maybe account for a really important discrepancy in comics history when it comes to the representation of women. Uh, and with that, I will yield the f metaphorical floor um, and prepared to defend my use of the Bechdel test. <laughs> I look forward to hearing your thoughts and uh, questions, but be nice to me. I'm fragile. <laughs>